Hey guys, so today we have part 2 of my V10 engine series, where we take a look at some of the coolest Chrysler vehicles with the Viper V10 engine. Now in part 1 I looked at 4 different vehicles, like the Sidewinder, Wrangler SRT10, and PT10. So check that out in the top right corner after this video if you're interested. Part 2 was supposed to be a similar format, but I decided to focus on just one vehicle, the crazy, outrageous, and powerful Dodge Tomahawk motorcycle with the Viper V10 engine. So yeah, as I was making this video, I got really interested in learning all about the Tomahawk, and I decided that it should have its own video since there's a whole lot of information on it. You'll find the video outline on screen of how we're going to make our way covering the Tomahawk, and let's begin. The Dodge Tomahawk was a non-street legal concept vehicle introduced by Dodge at the 2003 North American International Auto Show in Detroit, with Chrysler going off of the map and sticking a V10 into a motorcycle, although experts did argue over whether this is a true motorcycle. The motorcycle idea started with two lower-level Chrysler Group employees, Bob Schrader, who was a design office modeler and a motorcycle rider, and Dave Chitz, a vehicle builder and drag racer. So they got together and asked the question, what if we had a Viper engine and champion chassis, something like a Boss Haas? These were some pretty big ambitions, as the Boss Haas is built around a Chevy 5.7 liter V8, but it was only available in limited quantities. The largest displacement mass-produced motorcycle at the time was the 2.3-liter Triumph Rocket 3. And six to seven years later in 2009, British engineer Alan Milliard would also create a one-off Viper V10 motorcycle, but obviously the Chrysler guys thought of it and did it first. So these guys dreamed big, wanting to use an 8.3-liter V10 from the Viper on the bike. They took it to senior VP of design Trevor Creed, who shot it down, saying, we don't build bikes, but he did allow some sketches to be created, and they were mind-blowing enough to get the idea rolling. Now as for the design, the four-wheel look goes to the credit of Freeman Thomas, the Daimler Chrysler Vice President of Advanced Design at the time. He wanted to use two wheels front and back, because he figured using the traditional one wheel would look too thin, and not proportionate to the massive engine in the middle. After that, Chrysler staff designer Mark Walters took over. He argued that the two-wheel design might turn off real biker and motorcycle enthusiasts, but the uniqueness won and he went to work on the concept. In the spring of 2002, Walters had drawn a massive sketch on a 20-foot wall and had a Viper engine resting on wheels as a visual aid. Walters presented everything to Chrysler Group COO Wolfgang Bernard and COO Dieter Zeitsche, and they immediately approved, so the Tomahawk was in business. So those two executives approved the full running and working concept to be created, outsourcing the engineering and fabrication to RM Motorsports in Wixom, Michigan, which was a specialty shop. Kurt Bennett was the main man there, with the goal to turn Walters' sketch into a real-life machine. It's a beautiful-looking bike, with a monocoque construction, and all the body pieces are custom-milled from a block of aluminum. But of course, the main appeal is the engine, with five cylinders sticking out on each side, and it's literally between your legs, but we'll get to that in a bit. The Tomahawk got a new patented front and rear swing arm suspension, so that means four wheel independent suspension where each set of the wheels can lean together and have contact with the ground at the same time. The upper and lower front control arms are made from polished billet aluminum, and they're mounted via a ball joint to aluminum steering uprights and hubs with 5 degree caster. There's a single adjustable coilover damper and center lock racing style hubs that connects the swing arm to the outboard side of each of the front two wheels, with another steering link connected to the handlebar shaft. The rear has the center lock hubs and adjustable coilover as well, with push rod and rocker actuated mono linkage. There's also a rear lockable recirculating hydraulic parking stand, so the bike can stand on its own. The engine was put as low to the ground as possible, creating a very low center of gravity for better control at higher speeds. There were a few downsides to the suspension setup, like a very small lock to lock steering range with the handlebars, with only about 18 degrees per side. So that means a very large turning radius, where sharp turns are physically impossible. Computer images also showed the suspension allowed for a 45 degree lean, with all four wheels touching the pavement, before a swing arm would hit the ground. But in reality and during testing, it was proved that there were actually huge stability issues, with testers claiming that it, quote, rides like two motorcycles riding in ultra-close formation, coupled with the weight of three and the horsepower of four, end quote. RM Motors had actually been working on different variations that had two or three wheels instead of four and wider handlebars for more control, and that was probably required for street legality. As for what the bike rides on, the tires are custom-made Dunlops, P120-6020 fronts, and P150-5020 rears. The wheels are billet aluminum discs, 
20 by 4 inch up front and 20 by 5 in the rear. Finally, the brakes are also 20 inches with drilled machine stainless steel rotors in the front and cast iron in the rear, one per wheel for a total of four. The front also has custom two four piston fixed aluminum calipers per wheel, which means 16 pistons total in the front with a blue anodized finish, and those are hand activated. The rear has one four piston fixed aluminum caliper per wheel, so that's eight pistons total in the back, and those brakes are foot activated. As mentioned, the 8.3 liter Viper V10 engine was used, giving the bike a whopping 500 horsepower and 525 pound feet of torque. It's a 90 degree engine, liquid cooled, and 505 cubic inches. The V10 did need some changes to fit in this application, as the lubrication system was changed from a wet sump to a dry sump, and the single radiator in front of the engine was changed to two smaller ones that fit into the V-shaped space above the engine. And the engine was paired with a two-speed manual transmission that was foot shifted. Dodge was back and forth with their performance claims with this Tomahawk. In the various press releases about the motorcycle, Dodge kept claiming two different theoretical top speeds. Sometimes they said 420 miles per hour, which is 680 kilometers per hour, and other times they said 300 miles per hour, which is 480 kilometers per hour. Not once did they answer how they calculated those figures. One Dodge rep even said, quote, if a 3,400 pound Viper goes 190, this will go 400 easy, end quote. While the Chrysler designer that we talked about earlier, Mark Walters, said that he believed if they geared the bike for top speed, then 250 miles per hour would be in reach. It's also worth noting that the curb weight is just 1,500 pounds. I did some extra research and checked out that Milliard Viper V10 bike that we talked about briefly in the background and inception part of the video. If you missed it, British engineer Alan Milliard stuck an 8 liter Viper V10 into a motorcycle in 2009, and that was tested in the real world, hitting a top speed of 207 miles per hour. So Dodge's claims of 300 to 420 mile per hour are definitely a bit far-fetched, and it would seem like they based their top speed estimate on just the horsepower and final drive ratio, but ignored other critical factors like frontal area, drag coefficient, and rolling resistance. So we can't trust Dodge for that one. And the claim 0 to 60 time was 2.5 seconds, which seems reasonable. And of course, Dodge could never back up their top speed claims, as the Tomahawk was drivable, with four riders having driven the concept. But Chrysler's chief operating officer, Wolfgang Bernard, said that no one had ever gone faster than 100 miles per hour with it, and it had never been tested on a track or dyno. Now here's a quick comparison chart between the 2003 Dodge Viper SRT10 and the Tomahawk. Obviously, this is like comparing apples to oranges, one's a car and one's a bike, but I thought it would be cool to see the differences. The only thing they really share is the Viper V10. The things that the two vehicles, the, the Tomahawk and the Viper, have in common are uh, obviously the power plant and the fact that there are four wheels uh, on both vehicles. And I would say the quantity of testosterone that's in the mix of both. Believe it or not, the future plans were to take this bike to production one day. Chrysler COO Wolfgang Bernard was very enthusiastic about the project, and the president at RM Motorsports, Bud Bennett, admitted in an interview that Chrysler had told him way back in 2003 that if he could find 20 serious Tomahawk buyers, they would give him enough money for the project to make 100 production units. So clearly Chrysler was on board with this, as long as they had enough demand. The concept was a rolling sculpture as Chrysler called it, but the intent was truly there. I found some conflicting information as to how many were actually produced, but it does look like the RM Motorsports shop hand-built four different units. One for Chrysler, one for the owner of the shop, and two others were sold to private collectors for $500,000 each. I also found some claims that there were nine different replicas sold for $555,000 each. All of the ones that were on sale were advertised as rolling sculptures that could drive, just not legally on public roads. As cool and unique of an idea as this was, the more you looked at it, the more dangerous and unfeasible it became in multiple ways. First, the estimated cost to build each bike was $200,000, as each unit cost Chrysler $100,000 to build, not including the initial engineering and development costs. So that means each Tomahawk would have a hefty selling price of maybe $250,000 to $300,000 US and then some, which wasn't realistic and they didn't see enough demand for it. It was also simply not street legal according to the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, who says that a motorcycle can have no more than three wheels on the ground during normal operations. So there was also lots of criticism and backlash once the initial awe and interest died down. I was surprised to see that a lot of people actually hated on this thing, maybe jealous that Chrysler was outlandish enough to do it, or feeling that it was a waste of money. The Tomahawk was greeted with jokes and sarcasm from the press, 
who called it one of the strangest Dodge vehicles, one of Chrysler's nuttiest concepts, and that anyone who would ride this was a Darwin Award contender. They lamented Dodge's failure to realize an appropriate top speed, calling it the work of spin doctors. As we remember, Dodge didn't include many important factors in their calculations. One writer for Motorcycle Consumer News, Glenn Kerr, took it really seriously and analyzed the Tomahawk as if it was a real-life production motorcycle. Maybe that wasn't the best approach for a concept vehicle, but in his mind, he was seeing if it was a viable bike. He called it lazy and careless, and that the designers and engineers were underwhelmed by the challenge. His reasons were a small gas tank, as the Tomahawk could only travel 50 miles on a fill-up, and had the uncomfortable design and ergonomics of a dragster motorcycle. And another writer wrote that the Tomahawk was, quote, essentially worthless as a usable vehicle, end quote. First off, let me start by saying that all that negative criticism was totally ridiculous, and this motorcycle created a ton of positive takeaways for Chrysler. Usually when I talk about concept cars that didn't make it, I always have a what-if segment at the end, but for the Tomahawk, it was never really serious enough for me to ask that question. At best, there might have been 100 sold, and there would have probably been some huge liability issues. But again, going back to the positive takeaways for Chrysler, I do believe that they achieved their goal of making an outrageous and unexpected concept. Celebrating the Viper engine and showing that Chrysler had balls of steel and was willing to do anything. Before we end the video, I want to show you guys some examples of what the rest of the automotive world said about the Tomahawk, because their words sound better than mine. On screen, you can see some quotes where people have called it a total adolescent wet dream, that it was almost an icon of American automotive history, and that it was a machine so resolutely evil, it has chunks of VMAX in its stool. So Chrysler did end up with more praise than negativity for this bike, as they showed that they were a company full of creative people, not afraid to experiment outside their boundaries. The Tomahawk generated tons of attention, and sent the message that Chrysler was bold, ambitious, and fearless. In fact, the Tomahawk was so popular that many companies would even copy the design, and you can buy your own Tomahawk knockoff from Alibaba for around $3,300 US dollars shipped. Unfortunately, instead of the Viper V10, you are getting a small 150cc or 0.15 liter single cylinder four stroke engine with an automatic transmission, and instead of going 200 plus miles per hour, you can top out at about 55. But you can choose from 34 different paint schemes. So that's the end of this video guys. What did you think of the Tomahawk? Let me know down in the comment section below. I found this very enjoyable to go through the Tomahawk and see what it was all about, and I'm in no way a motorcycle enthusiast, so hopefully you guys felt the same. So make sure to like and subscribe for more Mopar content, and if you have any other video topic suggestions, I'm always open to hearing them, so leave a comment below. I'll see you guys in the next video.